Coming up after this next song is my special guest today, uh, Dr. Rob Kelly. Rob is originally from Manchester, England, and this guy really does have an amazing story. He's been to hell and back due to alcohol addiction. He has an amazing story, an inspiring story. Rob is also a musician, and this is an original song of Rob's uh, before we bring him on. It's called Oh God. Sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Sometimes overwhelmed and stressed and overloaded. A huge problem knocks me flat. Special guest today is Dr. Rob Kelly. Rob, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining hey, you us. Know, good to see you, man. How are you? I'm doing good. You're okay? Awesome. Absolutely awesome today. Well, before we talk about your journey, you're also a musician, and we'll get to all that. The thing. But what I want to do is, uh, that was your song, Oh God. Can you just talk us briefly through that, the track? Nice track. Yeah, it was, um, I walked, in, walked into my house, uh, house one day, and, and a guy who's a drummer, and uh, he said, uh, do you want to do a quick song? So we went upstairs and I thought he meant, do you want to do a song you know? So we, we tracked it on an, on an iPad. That's all tracked. And it's all me playing all the instruments and all the backing. And my friend was doing the, the, uh, the drums. We just made it up as we went along. Really? So it's like a garage band. Yeah, it was crazy. Nice track. Good track. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so you're originally from Manchester, England. Your story was about a serious battle with alcohol addiction which went from social drinking to where it gripped you so hard, you ended up homeless on the streets in Manchester. Where would you like to begin? Ooh, okay, well, for those guys who know Manchester, I was born in Moss Side, which is a bit like Beirut with lights. And I grew up on the race course estate, so anybody know, everyone who knows the race course estate. So it was rough. It, it was kind of lower class and uh, started drinking on stage. 
because that was my career. I wanted to be a professional musician. So at the age of uh, nine, I was on, it was actually Liverpool Irish Centre, would you believe that it actually oh, really? happened? Of, of, yeah. Up on Mount Pleasant there. Yeah, exactly. That's it's, exactly what it was. It's so, not there yeah. anymore. Yeah, it's gone now. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So we turned up there and, and there were so many people. We wasn't used to that many people. It was my auntie and uncle I'm playing with. It was like a trio. Mm. And uh, we, we turned up and played the first half and I was so scared, man. I, I've never been so scared in my life. So when I come off, my, my uncle said, here, try this beer. And I drank it and the rest is history, kind of. But, you know, I knew I liked drinking. I knew I knew that was the deal for me. But mm. every time I did something good, drink was behind it. Nothing bad happened to me in the early days. There's a couple of things that happened. So when I was about 14, maybe 15, there was a, there was a, a, a recording studio in Stockport called Strawberry Studios. Uh, ex, uh, 10CC owned it at the time. That's a famous studio, studio, yeah. Yeah. So I went for a bass playing job to make the commercials and, and stuff. And I got it at the age of 14. So I used to walk around with the bass drum and like all the time. So I was, I, I kind of knew, I knew my trade. And after a few years there, um, I was desperate to go to college because nobody's been to college in my family, but I was fighting this alcoholism. I've always wanted to be better than anybody else. So I applied for a job at Abbey Road, um, the famous Abbey Road. And uh, it took me, uh, I think it was about five or six auditions. And uh, But every time I went in, I drank more beer. So I had one beer for the first uh, audition. I had two beers for the second. I was on about five or six. So I had six beers. So I was drunk by the time I went into Abbey Road studio and did my session and come home way before cell phones. And I got a letter through the, through the mail about four or five days later and said that I got the position, which gave me an open ticket to drink as much as I want. What age were you? You got the Abbey Road gig, yeah? At what age? Uh, 16. Wow. So you were an Abbey and Road I, session player at 16? Yeah. And uh, played with Elton John, David Bowie, Queen, all them great guys that, that come through there. Yeah. And I was kind of there. But it was kind of, it wasn't hush-hush. But what would happen is a band would come in uh, or go anywhere, record it, and uh, sort of come out and go to number one. About a year after they were signed, they get the first check. Usually everyone goes crazy. Well, if a bass player goes crazy and can't turn up because they're too drunk or wasted or in rehab, then I jump in. So I've played loads of tracks. They never tell you what track you're paying. Mm. You come in, you get paid, and then you give it an option. You can have an, uh, a mention on the album if the track goes to the album. You know, there's 20 odd songs that we've done for 12 to go on the album. Or you can take, I think it was an extra thousand dollars. Well, back in those days, thousand dollars was a lot of money. So I told, I always took the money. So I was, I was really earning a lot of money back then. Wow. So we've already established you're a musician, Rob. Uh, but as well as studying at Oxford University, where you gained a PhD to become a doctor, you're also a policeman. So in what order did these professions come about? It was it the music first? It was the music for, I've, I've always done music. I've had a music room at the house. I've mm. always done music, but it was college and straight into the police force, and but they fired me for being drunk. So I was drunk on duty every day. So you went from college straight to being a policeman, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I joined the Freemasons really early because they, I had a friend who's a friend who was a Freemason. There was no way would I get in the Freemasons in England. Over here, it's kind of really lenient, but over there, like, it's just crazy. But I got in because they needed an organist. They've been yeah. without an organist for like two years. Yep. So I was kind of fast-tracked through to a friend of mine. I mean, I live on a council estate. Who the hell is going to, you know, <laughs> the Freemasons are all posh and they're all there with the boats. I'm on a council estate trying to wing it, you yeah. know. Yeah. And that's what I've done most of my life because at college it felt like an imposter, you know, coming from Moss Side, living on the race course. Next thing I'm after being college at Oxford University, Green's College. is like, it's crazy. I, I went to be an actual doctor, an MD, but they, they threw me out of the course because I was too drunk. Go into PhD or go home. That's what I was going to say to you. The PhD was to be a doctor. Then did you have to study for the policeman part too? Yeah. No, not much because I, 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 I had an average. You do a test and then you go straight in if you pass the test and the physical. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the PhD was very hard. So you, Studying a lot of hours. Was you a policeman on my side? No, it's actually a piece in Stratford, oh, okay. which is the right. M division, yeah. So you, yeah. you get to do all the free matches when United was playing at home. Yeah. But later, and this is crazy, I went on to be a counsellor at Manchester United. Wow. Yeah, you know, I mean, Beckham's a friend of mine and, and Keane. Yep. Uh, me and Keane have a, I used to have a really close relationship. I can't say too much. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I used to kind of mentor 
to a little degree. So yeah, it was good. Good old days. Okay. You lost your career. You lost your family, and you're those homeless. So you <coughs> you were married with a couple of kids. Is that right? Yeah, I got married when uh, I don't know how or why we did it, but we got married, and then my drinking was taking off then, mm. big style. So I um, back in the day before cell phones, there was uh, mobile installations being built for the army and the navy and all that and i started a company doing that of course it was a success millions of dollars bought the house on the hill uh porsche's bentley's had all that but of course it masked my alcoholism because i was drinking it and i was drinking vodka every day and nobody can stop me because look what i'm providing look who i am you know mm. but after and it continues so i wanted to kill i went i really wanted to stop drinking but i didn't think i had a problem so we had our first child and i got a bible to the hospital and I held her in my hands, and I put my hand on the Bible, and I swore to my wife I'd never drink again. It's the worst four hours of my life, because that's all I freaking lasted, four hours. Really? So the con- drinking continued. Then a second child did the same thing with two Bibles now, on the hand, swore I'd never drink again. Five hours later, I'm drinking again. So it was absolute chaos in the house while the children were being, were, were being brought up as babies, because I was always drinking or drunk. And I remember coming downstairs one morning at uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I knew I'd got some vodka somewhere. I just knew I'd got some vodka somewhere. So I was searching around the house and uh, I found a bottle in the kitchen cabinet. Now here's a couple of crazy things here. When I, it's half a bottle of vodka. So I'll put it on the side for a second, Joe. And I turn around and I'm looking for a, a crystal glass because I'm not an alcoholic or a bum. I'm looking for a crystal glass to drink this freaking al- alcohol at 2.30 in the morning, trying to, trying to fool myself that it's okay. But my wife had followed me down and I didn't see her. So when I turned around to get the crystal glass, she snatched the bottle off the side and said, I think you've had enough, Rob. Let's think about that for a second. It's 2.30 in the morning. I'm due to go to work. Maybe it's right. What I should have done, Joe, thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Uh, I'm going to go up to bed, sleep another four hours and go into work, drive to work for that board meeting. What I did was took a kitchen knife out and stabbed her three times. And that was my alcoholism. That, that's how, and, it, and that wasn't worse. It got worse than that. It got worse than that. I remember going through the marriage and... Uh, when, I, when I stabbed her, I came home and she had all her cases packed. And I says, where are you going? She said, I'm going back to my mom's. I'm, I love you to bits, Rob, but you're not going to kill my kids. And I went, nobody leaves me. What, do you know who I am? Still got that attitude, you know, poor boy got rich kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so she took him. I got into my attorney next day. I said, here's check here for 10 grand. I don't know how much it was. Go to the courts and get them back now. Anyway, a day later, he came back. There was a knock on the door, and there was my attorney, my solicitor, with uh, my two kids, about ages one and three or something like that. Now, for anybody that's got a drink problem out there or drug or anything like that, listen to this. You'll relate to this, and everyone else probably starts crying. But here's the deal, guys. I got my two kids. I took them into the front room. I sat them down in front of the TV, and I went to the kitchen. And I thought to myself, one, one beer be great to celebrate my kids coming back. So I remember the... Tsh- of, of the of the can of lager and then three days later um they kicked the door down i was unconscious i don't remember anything kids has not been changed nappies not been fed for three days you know they come in the house they grab me they handcuff me and said you you know call me all names serve me with papers saying unfit father so i'm walking to the door as they're taking the kids off me the authorities are there the police are there child services are there mother-in-law was there and my wife was there and my daughter said three things to me Said, Daddy, Daddy, please don't go. And then as you're walking up the path, she said, Daddy, Daddy, please get better. And she got to the garden gate and opened it. She turned around one more time and said, Daddy, Daddy, please stop drinking. And that was it. Wow. Never see my wife again. Never see my youngest daughter again. And uh, my my youngest daughter, my eldest daughter, got in contact with me four years ago on Facebook. Yeah. And we've been back to England, saw my granddaughter. So it was awesome. But that's where it took me, you know. Do you remember using so, the knife when you said you yeah, stabbed your wife? You, yeah, yeah. You, you remember? I remember that, yeah. It was just, it was fear and anger and the fact that I needed it, you know? Alcoholics get to this point where they know if, if they're coming off it and they can't find it, they're going to go into DTs. It means the whole body's going to start closing down, the central nervous system is closing down, and before I know it, it's, I'm fitting on the floor and probably dying. So that's what it was all about. But I remember it as if it was yesterday. And after that, you became homeless after this episode with the kids? Yeah, it was like six months after the cars had gone, the house had gone, the wife had gone, kids had gone, business had gone. Mom and dad threw me out, wouldn't speak to me ever again. Brother and sister, brother still doesn't speak to me. 
mm. threw me out and I'm, and I'm homeless. So I went to the middle of, of Manchester, Piccadilly Gardens, and I'm sat in the middle, and that become my that become my bed, my dining room, and uh, my guest room, the bench in in the centre of Manchester uh, for 14 months, and okay. I lived there. What was your business at this time? You said you lost your business. What What was you doing? Yeah, I, I was. I was. I was uh, in practice as a doctor. Okay, so it was it was the, the doctor profession. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How long was your homeless? I know. Fourteen months. Fourteen months. In a couple of days. Yeah. It was horrendous. Joe, I woke up one morning and the guy next to me is stabbed to death for his training shoes. That's the kind of life I was. I mean, I was really, you know, a lot of drugs around, a lot of homeless. Mm. I had to fight every day. I had to bare knuckle fight sometimes to get money just to eat because I couldn't steal any towards the end because they all knew who I was. You know, I had all my teeth knocked out, I had my nose broken, I've fractured ribs, all sorts of shit on the streets, but mm. I fought every day to survive. How did you come out the homelessness? You say it was 14 months? You were on the streets 14 months? 14 months, yeah. And, and I remember the night, it was, a, it was a long night, and, you know, I'm not a God guy or anything like that. I don't believe in it. Brought up with a... With a uh, a choir master molesting me as a kid. So, but I fall down to my knees one night and uh, I started to cry from my belly. I, was, I wasn't crying because I lost my, my kids and my wife. I was crying because the first time in my life I couldn't stop drinking. I knew I couldn't stop drinking and I was going to die. This is after six suicide attempts. Two of them actually worked. They brought me back. My heart stopped. They brought me back to, to life on, on a back end street, stinky street in Manchester, Cobble Street, two times. I was so pissed with them guys. And I remember crying and looking up to the sky and saying, if there's a God up there, I can't do this on my own anymore. And about 30 seconds later, 3 o'clock in the morning, a guy walked over, missed his Bible study, missed the book by, bus back home and was walking, found me, asked me, do I need help? I said, yeah. He took me back to his house, and that's the reason why I'm here today. Okay. I know. It's crazy. So when did you make the move, the move to the United States? Because you've been in Texas uh, <coughs> 14 years, right? I've been, uh, yeah, I came straight to Texas. Well, I came 14 years ago for two weeks. Mm. So there was a big church in, in uh, Plano, which is one of the affluent places in Dallas, yep. used to be. And uh, they, they paid me to come over and, and spend two weeks with their youth ministry, educating them about crack cocaine, because it was all new back then. Mm. So I did that, but I don't know what happened, Joe, but when I, stood, when I got off the plane at DFW, which is the airport just outside Dallas, I knew that I would never go back home, not to live anyway. Really? So, yeah, so I started over here, got my license, my psychology license transferred, uh, moved in with this girl, and then uh, just started working with someone. And then what happened is um, we bought a ranch out in the, out in the sticks, and we, we turned the ranch into an exclusive one-patient rehab. And uh, I can't tell you exactly – well, I can tell you one uh, – the, the one of I got three really major guys I've worked with. Uh, one is is strong. He's like an Iron Man, very strong. Okay. Uh, and the other is uh, a great rapper, but he's not black. And then and then Eddie Eddie Van Halen, who always says I can, I can mention it. So yeah, it was good. So you run now. You run the successful Rob Kelly Recovery Group. Um, so because you've been down that dark road, you can obviously relate to the person's addiction and you're known as the addiction doctor, right? Yeah. 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 I was intrigued by your quote. Um, it's not the drinking, it's the thinking. So you have your own, your own strategy yeah. for treating these patients, right? Yeah, definitely. My own program that I made up and it all comes from this, Joe. I mean, I'm in Manchester somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure what time frame it was, but it's snowing. I'm outside a shop you know, like the uh, the uh, shops on the corner who sold alcohol. And I stood outside this shop waiting to open at 5.30 in the morning. It's snowing. I got a vest on, pair of shorts and flip-flops, and I'm sweating like crazy. And I'm shaking, and I got a banging headache. And I got my 10 pounds in my hand, and I'm shaking. And he opens the door, and he knows who I am. He can't st serve alcohol until 10 o'clock. But God bless this guy. He just, are you doing okay, Rob? Yeah. I put my ten pound, and for some unknown reason, he put the bottle on the counter, and I grabbed the top of the top of the bottle, and this what happened. I went, <sighs> headache stop, shaking stop, sweat stop, and I looked at the bottle, and I looked at the shopkeeper, and I looked back at the bottle, and I thought, oh my god, it's not the alcohol, it's not the alcohol, it's me. So I built my program around that alcohol for symptom. Forget about that. It's, it's all my shit that I'm going through as a child. 
and, and uh, a, a programmed brain from a predisposition of alcoholism in the family messed up with childhood trauma and uh, being bullied at school. And when I took, when, when I noticed it wasn't the alcohol, I set about my studies and, and now I'm like a concierge doctor. So it's, I'm not run of the mill. You can't book into our place. It's always a one-on-one -on -one and you have to pass a certain test before you come in and we'll work with you. But we have a almost a hundred percent success rate going yeah. over 20 odd years and six and a half thousand patients. So we, I know what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. You know, I'm really aggressive about this shit because Joe, it wrecked my family. You know, the youngest Absolutely. kid I do, still don't see. And then my mom died of cancer earlier because she was worried every night. It's what the doctor told me. She was out of her brains every night worrying about you. In fact, sometimes, Rob, she used to say, when she heard a police car go past, I hope it's for me to come and tell me that Rob's dead because I could just wow. stop worrying and know he's in peace. I can relate to someone today. So just going back to that morning before we carry on, that morning you said you went with the £10, the guy gave you the vodka. Yeah. Are you saying everything stopped before you even opened the bottle? You just, just yeah. So just holding the bottle, you didn't take a drink just, out of it. Exactly. And the DTs and, and everything the, stopped? Everything stopped. And that and that's when I looked at it. Because when I take four or five drinks out, I'm, I'm, I'm drunk. I'm, I'm almost in blackout. So, yeah, it was the holding that changed my body and my brain. And that's what intrigued me. It's like, what the hell is going on? So I started some serious studies. And everyone else around is like, well, alcoholism, yeah, it's just it's a choice. And I fought and I fought and I fought to tell families and, and people that are suffering it's not a freaking choice. Mm. It's a disease. It's a biochemist, uh, biochemical di disease with a predisposition, which mm. means you can't drink yourself into becoming an alcoholic. Yeah. I, nothing's good enough for me. You know, that, that, that let's forget the alcohol for a second. If I want to buy a guitar, it has to be the best guitar in the shop. If I go in the sandwich shop with a friend, I go, hey, what do you want? He goes, I have a sandwich. What do you want, Rob? Uh, give me two sandwiches, four bags of chips and, and three Cokes and that. Nothing is in. I've got to get everything, you know. Oh, should we live in the house there? No, I want to live in the biggest house in, in this area. Should I drive this car? No, I want I want the best car that money can buy. It's crazy, yeah. and that's addiction. The alcohol's the symptom. It could be porn. It could be food. It could be sex. It could be gym. Anything that's taken to excess. So it's all. That's where you you get your thing. It's not the drinking. It's the thinking. You know. To be honest yes. with you, I sometimes. I sometimes question myself, and I don't mind saying this on air. Um, you know what it's like a, as a musician being in that social scene. And I have been since the age of 15, and I still am at, 50, <coughs> at 52. Now, when I'm at home on my nights off, it doesn't even cross my mind to even want to have a drink, or in the morning, or throughout the day. But it's still easy to get sucked in when you're entertaining a crowd and people want to buy you a pint. You know, and I still go to that through that phase where sometimes I'll just stop for a month and I'll do my gigs and stuff. Then I'll go back. Then I'll kick myself saying, oh, I feel rough today. And I've just had a month of feeling great. So yeah. I do quiz myself sometimes, to be honest with you, you know, because it's... Um, yeah. And I've also got a cousin who I spoke to this morning and told him you're coming on the show. He's a recovering alcoholic. He's, he's back home in Liverpool. He's been through a lot. And he's really intrigued to, you know, yeah. to listen to you today. So... Um, I, I know yeah. that this was my gift. I, and there's two things I can do, Joe. I can get somebody well from addiction. I can play guitar. I can play any guitar. If you give me any, give me bagpipes. Give me two minutes on the back. I'll, I'll get a tune out of it. Okay. You know, probably like yourself. I don't know how, it, I don't know how people can't play a guitar. Mm. Never own playing it, you know, and I, bass <laughs> is my instrument. Bass is my session instrument, but yep. that's what I'm a natural at. And I'm a natural at what I do today. Yep. Nobody gets out of our, we do a 90 day program. Nobody gets away without having their life back. An amazing life back. One of my philosophies is how far do you want to push this? How rich do you want to be? Because I wanted three things when I came here, Joe. I wanted to be a millionaire. I wanted to be uh, a TV uh, celebrity. Uh, and the other one was I wanted to be a United States citizen. Check, check, and check. Now, my final one is on Wednesday. I go, I go and do my ceremony with, you know, the flag waving. And I'm, I'm, I'm a British citizen, uh, American citizen. But, you know, it's all about focus. It's yeah. all about mind strength. It's all about what do you want? Because mm. it doesn't matter who you are. You can be anybody you want. And this is what I tell people. Forget what, what I do. It's depression, don't feel good enough. You know, if, you're not, if you listen to this and you don't feel good enough or don't feel worthy and don't think you can, you can achieve anything, I want to apologize to you guys. Somebody put that there. That's not how we're born. You know, when we're kids, go, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a fireman. I want to be a spaceman. Where the yeah. hell did all that go? 
it got beaten out of us psychologically. That's what it got, you know? Mm. Never share your dreams with people who never share your dreams is one of my catchphrases. Yeah. You know, you can yeah. do anything. Did you ever make it up with the family back home? Uh, I know you yes, said you were I, I made it up with mom, though she was, uh, though she was heavy dosed on morphine at the time. Mm. I went back last year only after all them years. Because my dad was one of them dads, I don't know about yours, Joe, but you could never really speak to him. He never told me he loved me. He couldn't open presents in front of me. It was really quiet and shy. So I went back and I made my amends and we both cried, yeah. which we'd never done before in front of each other. And then about two weeks later, he, he had a stroke and now he doesn't recognize me. So but at least I got my amends in. Did it to my okay. ex-wife, did it to both my children, my sister mm. and my brother. But the only thing is... My brother came over here, Joe, and we showed him a great time, and he loved it. And and about two years ago, I found out that as soon as I left the house, he was going round to my wife's, you know, really? doing what he's not supposed to do. So we oh. don't speak today okay. uh, because I just can't forgive that. Oh. But the rest of them, yeah, especially my oldest daughter and my sister, are very close in my life today. Now you've appeared on Joe Rogan podcast, even the Oprah Winfrey show, and so you've really got your story out there. And I'm honoured to have you on my show. You've also DVDs and your book, uh, your book, Daddy, Please Stop Drinking. Can we talk about your book? Yeah, well, first of all, it was the, everyone kept saying, write a book, Joe. You've got to write a book, you've got to write a book. Everyone has spoken and heard my stories like, oh, my God, that's a success story. And then news people started picking up in Dallas. And they, so eventually when I met my, my wife today, who married six years, mm. and she said, let's write that book. So, you know, God bless that woman, Joe. I could not have sat down and wrote a book. I can't do it. I've not got the attention span. If you send me a text got more than 10 words in, it ain't going to get read. You know, it's, I'm kind of one of those guys. You know, if you send me an email with, oh, no, no there's no way it's going to get read, you know. Yeah. But I give a bits and pieces of my life when they come up because I can't always remember them. But if you're walking down the street, I'll see something. It'll trigger something off in my head. And I'll say to her, oh, there was this time. And God knows how she did it. But she came up with this book. So before we published it i got in touch with my daughter that's after she got you know she came up and we spoke and we chatted and it was just amazing and then i was chatting to my wife and i said what should we call the book and she said what about the last thing your daughter said to you and i went what daddy daddy please stop drinking and that's where it come from it's a book of of my life it's a book of what i used to do there's some great stories in there there's sad points but more importantly there's um information for the family of how you how you can you know, help loved ones if they're going through this because yeah. everybody knows somebody. That's the that's that's the thumb of rule, the rule yeah. of thumb. And if you don't, it's probably you. That's what I always say to people because everybody. I can be sat in Starbucks, you know, the English voices like over here. They love it. Yeah, they go, "Can I have I a large tea, please?" Oh my God, where are you from? <laughs> they get talking, and then, "Oh, yeah. what, well, what are you doing over here?" And I tell them, "They go, oh my uncle, oh my husband, oh my yeah. son." Everybody has a story about somebody. Well, the funny thing with me, the funny thing with me, when I do my gigs at Wax O'Connor's, and I met you there, right? You you came in in the river. I've been there 15 years. Because of this accent here, I mean, uh, the the Americans come over to me and they say, oh, my God, you know, I went to Dublin. I was in Dublin last year, and my great-grandfather was um, an old Donald and all this. (laughs) And I just let it carry on, really, because, you know, the yeah. it, it are different accents here. You, you get taken for Scottish, you know, you get taken yeah. for, yeah. I get taken for Australia. Irish all the time. <laughs> so your book, uh, Daddy, Daddy, Please Stop Drinking, where is it available, Rob? It's uh, Amazon and, and Walmart right now. Oh, it's actually so, in Walmart here. That's, okay, yeah. that's in Texas. Border. It's awesome. And, and what it is, I want to explain to somebody, I think we, we dropped it to $10, I think. Mm. And basically, I take no money. We, we, when you know when somebody says like uh, all the proceeds go or all the uh, sorry what's it say the all the profit goes to this charity yep. everything that goes in that book we don't take nothing off goes straight into into charity and what we do as well which is really cool is if if I see someone struggling you know if I'm passing a gas station I see a woman there with ten kids in the car I give her a hundred dollars if I see someone behind me that doesn't look too well I give them a hundred dollars. You know, we're always giving money. We give them $250,000 last year to, to people around uh, Texas and England and around around the world, really, yeah. because I'm really big into that. And, and, and that's where I find my, my biggest gift because we, we went to a school. We heard a story that in San Antonio somewhere, uh, two, uh, two African-American kids got turned back from, from lunches, from school lunches, because they didn't have any money. There was a back debt. Then parents couldn't afford to pay. 
So we went to a school and he's, he's like, uh, do you have a lunch debt? Oh, yeah, everybody does. He said, how much is it? And she told us. And I said, well, my assistant said, Dr. Rob would like to pay that off. And they were freaked. What? what? So we went in, we took a little photo with them, and we paid their complete lunch debt off. And that's what we do. I mean, we just love doing stuff like that. You know, we buy people pre- uh, gifts of presents for Christmas and birthdays and, yeah. you know, stuff like that. We, we just love doing stuff like that. No, uh, your um, Rob Kelly Recovery Group. How do people contact you if if, if they're listening today and they need help? Uh, obviously, okay, yeah. we're in Texas. <clears throat> we get a lot of people on this show listening from from the UK as well because it is expat yeah. radio. I, I'm the, the only one presenting in the USA right now. But you're based so you're based in San Antonio, right? Well, yeah. we're based in San Antonio. It, we, we, it's mostly telehealth that we do. Okay. It's ten percent visit. So we got offices in San Antonio, offices in Dallas. Offices in Manchester, and we have a a, a one-on-one. Uh, oh, so you do have offices in, over there, too? Yeah. So yeah. You do? Oh, okay. Yeah. So right. four offices around the world. Okay. Which is pretty cool. So head, I want to explain the Manchester office real quick. So um, when I got in touch with my daughter three or four years ago, she always wanted to be a counselor, just like me, mm-hmm. you know, and she wanted to maybe take a PhD and become a doctor, just like me. So when we got back in touch, I sent her back to school. Uh, for a uh, NLP uh, training course, so she'd become a practitioner. And she graduated uh, seven weeks ago. She graduated, Joe, and and two weeks ago, she took my first patient in Manchester. How the hell does that happen? That's Isn't a, that so cool? That's an incredible story. Absolutely so cool. And that's that's a blessing that, you know, you've made up there. And um, you say you got a grandchild too, yeah? Got a little grandchild. She's yeah. probably three or four now. But uh, yeah. I mean, when when you think about where I've come, and think about where I am today. It's almost impossible to do. But even with Abbey Road, there's some crazy things happening that I bought. We finished a session with Elton John once, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a really stormy night, and the electricity keeps cutting out, and the sound engine. It was just a horrible night. So he called it. So me and him, uh, the lead guitar player, his manager, and about four girls went back to his penthouse in, in the Savoy Hotel. Mm-hmm. For those guys that don't know the Savoy, it's the most, or used to be the most prestigious hotel in England. Yep. So he gets up to the penthouse suite and the wind and the rain and it's so a horrible night. And we're all, we're all drinking and stuff and I heard Elton from the bedroom screaming at somebody. And I walked in and he's, on the, he's got a phone in his hand. And I'm like, Elton, what are you doing? I'm telling them. What he was doing, he was calling down to reception. This is him wasted, by the way. Calling down to reception, telling them that if they didn't stop the wind and the rain, he would never book into that hotel again. Jesus. So I was surrounded by madness, you know, it was crazy. Absolutely crazy. And and, and what happened, I told my wife that, and, uh, yeah. you know, she used to tell people about it, but we went back about a year ago, and we, and we took one of them rides around London on the buses, and the guy actually said, that's where Elton was screaming. And my wife looked at me, and I said, I told you I wasn't kidding, you know, because after the stuff I'd done, I know she doesn't believe. Is your wife from Texas then? Yeah, she's uh, she's from Austin, okay. uh, born and bred. So yeah, yeah. so she's a uh, she's awesome. She's an absolutely awesome girl. But yeah, I I think I've found. I think I'm going to keep this for another forty years. If it doesn't work, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say to the listeners? Anything else you want to you you, you want to get out there? Oh, um, definitely. Listen, uh, <clears throat> this is the thing, guys. Look, I think I found the secret to living. I really do. And and I, and I want to, I want to, I want to pass it on to people. He's like, if you if you're sat in a, in a place somewhere, and you don't like your job, you know, you need to get another job. Life's too strong. If you don't like your wife, get a new wife. You know, and strategize it. You can beat anybody you want. Anybody you want. Quantum physics tells us that. So let's say a basketball court, for instance. Oh no, we're half of a British. Let's talk about a football field. You know. I can be on that football field up to 25 places at the same time because this isn't solid. My body isn't solid. Quantum physics tells me I could be 25 places at the same time. Where do I want to be? I want to be in the box. So as soon as I get the ball, I'm going to flip it in and become the hero of the game. People ask, how do you get there? Listen up, guys. You walk over and you take that position. That's it. Concentrate on what you want. If you want to be a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company, you can do that. Don't ever think you can't. It's BS. Don't ever think you can't go on to be something amazing because you can. You're an amazing husband, amazing dad, you know, earning $10 million a year. Of course you can. But we never see each other as as we are. 
we always got this little bit of guilt that nobody likes us. We can't be as good as that. You can. You have to get if you if you, if you're looking at the movies or CDs once and you want to get something to watch with a hidden secret in it, uh, there's a great movie out there, and uh, I forgot what it was right now. I feel pretty. It is. I feel pretty. Okay. There's a message in there, guys and girls. If you want to become something. Well, listen, I, I brought you on today to your original song called Oh God. I'm going to close you out with another song of yours called Life Worth Living. Do you want to talk about the song? Is it, is it yeah. to do with what you do? <clears throat> yeah, it's awesome. So um, <clears throat> we, we, uh, we had a studio in uh, Dallas. Me and two pilots got this studio. And we went in one day. And my friend at work kept saying, I want to sing. Have you ever sang? You know, no, no, not publicly. So we took him in the studio. Anyway, it was also a theme tune. It was going to be a theme tune for one of Oprah's uh, things she was going to do on TV. So we were to send it to the to the producer in Hollywood. So we did this. We all do our recordings live recorded. So there's no track by track. It's all live and remixed later. And yeah. this guy, we're coming up. I'm writing the lyrics on this whiteboard. And I'm going, okay, guys, let's do this and try that. Let's go to the bridge, finish the chorus, let's do that. And my mate says, oh, I could sing that. And I'm like, there's no way can you sing on this. Anyway, we give him a go and he made a fantastic job of it. Such a great voice. So it was kind of done within two hours. Yep. Uh, it was mixed down within three days and then we sent it up. It didn't get to the final. It got to like down to the last three, but that's how we come of it. And we just made the lyric. I made the lyrics up as we, as we were there live, just making them up. Well, let's hear the song. This is uh, Life Worth Living. Five, five, five four, four, three. Track. You say that's not you on vocals, that's your friend on vocals. I have a friend on vocals, yeah, who's never sang anywhere. He didn't even do karaoke. He sang in his bathroom, and his uh, wife mm -hmm. said, Oh, you're pretty good, you're amazing, you're amazing. And I didn't even know he, he says, Can I come to the studio with you? And I'm like, Yeah, yeah. of course you can. On the way down there, he says, I, I do a bit of singing myself. You know, what them friends that do that, yeah. oh, I do a bit of singing myself, and he turned out to be crap. <laughs> you know, I said, Oh, very, very good. Like when he come on and did that, we were all impressed, man. He was just like, What yeah. a great voice. Never done anything since either. Okay. Dr. Rob Kelly, thank you so much for joining us and for your time today, for sharing your incredible story. You're an inspiration to so many people. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for asking me. Uh, no, I asked you, actually. I saw this. I saw it. I'm like, I can't say why first. I just saw a post. and I'm like, i got to get on this. And then I put Brilliant. two and two together. That's the guy we saw that night. So awesome, Joe. Yes, my wife, as my wife said, there's a guy contacting me. And then when I'm, and I'm looking, I'm like, I'm just, I'm sure I know this guy. And when we got <laughs> chatting, small world, right? Yeah. I know it is. It is. Well, look, we can, you know, we can meet up in San Antonio. We're both here. So uh, we'll do lunch or something one day. Yeah. Sounds good. I appreciate right, it, man. Thank Thanks so for much. joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.